Cosby coming at you with music and fun, and if you're not careful, you may learn something before it's done. So let's get ready, okay? Hey, hey, hey! No hate, no hype, no fear. Your protection from, from, from deception. Straight to you from a large spaceship, currently parked at a small airport in the state of Iowa, listening in on a conversation between a flight controller and a flight instructor. Let's get a bit closer, shall we? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Strange World, where the truth is often stranger than fiction. I'm your host, Mark Sargent, the creator of Flat Earth Clues, which propose that all of us are living inside a Truman Show enclosed structure thousands of miles wide. Check it out at enclosedworld.com or just Google Flat Earth Clues. If you can't find it, well, then your search ability is terrible. It's awful. Uh, quick shout out, special thanks to, because uh, I just got this in the mail today, uh, John Rapp. He sent me, apparently, John Rapp, a uh, flat earther, created his own graphic novel called, and hopefully I get the title right here, Electromagnet, The Book of Rebel Nations by John Rapp. So thank you. Thank you very much. I can't wait to crack this thing open. I, I just got it in the mail like, like, 30 minutes before the show. So thank you, and uh, I will take a look as soon as I can. And a special shout-out to... i, I got to give credit every once in a while to, to new Flat Earthers that are out there. Uh, John Rapp isn't a new one, but one of the new groups that's out there it actually has their own show, and they're known as the NASA Fraudcast Channel. And that would be Chris and Rachel. Uh, I love your show, love the format, love what you're doing. So keep it up. Hope you uh, you know have smooth sailing from here forward. Um, before we get to, because tonight's a subject matter expert show, before we get to that, I'd like to read something real quick uh, from a listener that sent me a quote from, and I did not know this. In fact, I'm amazed that everybody else, you know, because the, the, the internet hive mind misses nothing and we get new stuff. We pick up little tidbits here and there. And this was a quote from the end of an article uh, that was written by George Orwell, of all people, in December 27th, 1946. It's real short, but I, I think it's pertinent, which is, and he says, most people, if asked to prove that the earth is round, would not even bother to produce the rather weak arguments I have outlined above. They would start off by saying that everyone knows the earth to be round, and if pressed further, would become angry. In a way, Shaw is right. This is a credulous age, and the burden of knowledge which we now have to carry is partly responsible. So, wonderful. And remember, that was 1946. NASA wasn't even founded until 12 years later. So, great, great stuff. 
A uh, quick recap, because again, this is a subject matter expert show. Uh, the people we have had so far, uh, again, we, you know, people contact me from time to time and say, hey, look, I, I think I can add to the conversation here and add to the weight of the argument that uh, the spinning globe model is just not going to cut it anymore. And so we have had, so far, since really in the last uh, what six months, not even six months, a uh, United States Navy missile instructor, a U.S. Air Force navigator, United States Marine Corps sniper instructor, a U.S. Navy submarine chief, a U.S. Army artillery radar operator, an Australian intelligence officer, a flight instructor out of Iowa, who happens also to be with us tonight, an industrial engineer specializing in valves and seals, a career surveyor of over 20, 32 years, an international shipping expert, and a corporate travel yeah agent, all relevant to the conversation, and I have enjoyed every one of these interviews. Tonight, we're going to add, appropriately enough, a, a um, uh, air traffic controller. And, uh, and I'd like to re- reread his uh, uh, letter that he sent me that pretty much got me to call him. He, he put his phone number in the email. Uh, and his name is Dale, and I'll introduce him in a second. Uh, but he writes in his, his email, I was an FAA certified ra- – sounds like it's a dating game thing, doesn't it? Uh, I was an FAA certified radar air traffic controller at NES Brunswick, which was a TRACON facility and airport. At night, I would get bored and set up my scope to max 350 miles. I turned it down to watch Boston traffic and warning areas, no fly zones. Well, according to the Globe Equation, I saw airplanes at 81,000 feet. Problem? They squawk their airspeed and altitude. So the Earth can't curve like they say. Granted, I was using surveillance radar. It's not that off, and the squawk is extremely accurate. My radar and the aircraft transponders prove the Earth curve is wrong. Very wrong. So, with that, I'd like to introduce Dale. How are you doing, Dale? Doing great. Thank you, Mark. Fantastic. And before we we learn a little bit more about you, as if that wasn't enough, uh, I'd also also like to bring in, because because as soon as I read this, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Jonathan Walter from Walter Aviation, one of our uh, other recent subject matter airport uh, uh, experts, he contacted me. Is that true? Yeah. Fantastic. And he's with us. So, hey, Jonathan. How's it going? (laughs) Good. So, yeah, you said, hey, I'd love to talk to this guy if he comes on. So, fantastic. Uh, You know, feel free. So what we're going to do is we're, you know, I'm going to I'm going to throw uh, uh, the microphone over to Dale here in a sec. We'll we'll kind of find out a little bit more about him and feel free, Jonathan, to just, you know, chime in with any questions or reference because you guys, you know, you know way more about aircraft than I do. Yeah. Uh, You know, I was I was super excited. Uh, I just want to be a fly on the wall and uh, hear hear what uh, Dale has to say. It's pretty interesting to have another uh, aviation related uh, guy on board. So cool, cool. Well, that's great. Well, glad glad to have you. And with that, uh, the first question I got to throw at you, Dale, because you know this comes up. Everybody wants to know uh, what what how how long have you been kind of looking or avoiding or dodging the flat Earth thing, and uh, what what got you into this now? Um, well, I guess officially I ran across the subject matter about eight months ago, but I had the pleasure of growing up in Southern California and, um, you know, I had a 180 degree view of the ocean and it always perplexed me as the sun is setting, this gigantic hot spot went all the way down, you know, where the sun is setting all the way to my feet. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this, this just doesn't seem right. Yeah. And, you know, when it rains and I see the clouds, I, I, I was. I also went to Cal Poly Pomona as uh, a structural engineer. Unfortunately, I didn't finish that degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I'm great at trig- trig- trigonometry and ge- geometry, and and you know, got an A in those subjects. And when I look at the sky and there's clouds, and I'm seeing these sunbeams going off at different angles, I'm scratching my head, going, "How can that be possible?" Okay. And so my whole life, I'm just observing things around the, you know, <laughs> traditionally say planet. Yeah. And uh, I'm just like, this doesn't make any sense. And um, then I ran across, uh, I don't know how it happened, but uh, the, there was this animated uh, video with the little kid on his, you know, wearing a backpack. And, you know, they're discussing the angles and the trigonometry and, uh, you know, um, and various subjects and the shadows as the sun sets, yeah. the shadows are all wrong. And I'm sitting going, yeah, yeah, I know that. I know that. I've been, I've been wondering about this stuff my whole life. And I started doing some more digging and more digging. And then after a while, um, I, I'm very good at explaining things away. And in my opinion, I, you know, didn't see any hard crew, hardcore proof. And, 
you know, and there's a guy uh, shining a laser beam like across the lake at the beach, and but the laser beam dispersed too much. Yeah, or, yeah the the Jaronism test, the famous Jaronism test. Yep. Yeah, and and I got so sick and tired, and I just threw my hands up there and I abandoned the whole thing, and I, I didn't listen to it for, you know, this about eight months ago. I ran across it and threw my hands up there and forgot about it for the last three months. Okay. And I don't know how it happened. Again, I ran across uh, the Jonathan interview, and he's talking the, about the uh, the United States Air Force uh, retired. No, uh, the Jonathan Wal- Walter. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Go yeah, ahead. I yeah. ran across the Jonathan Walter, and he's talking about how he can fly an aircraft for 100 miles, and he doesn't have to adjust anything on his aircraft, and he can just fly straight and level. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, oh my God, I was an air traffic controller. I have the hardcore proof. I mean, forget this laser beam test. I'm watching some, you know, airport surveillance radar at aircraft 350 miles away. I'm receiving a radar blimp. I can see their altimeter. I can see their airspeed. I can see everything. And I'm like, um, maybe I should go into the story about how that happened. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I was late at night. We didn't have a very busy airport and they start sending people home and I was bored in the, um, a TRACOM facility means, uh, at that time the Navy only had two TRACOM facilities in the world. I happen to be at one of them. It just means your approach controller. Um, you know, we have out to 60 miles airspace up to 30,000 feet. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Usually that's a civilian job, but we had that job. And uh, so I was bored one night, and the facility manager said, hey, why don't you sit that scope and set out to 350 miles? And I'm scratching my head going, what? <laughs> the radar goes to 350 miles? You've got to be kidding me. You never knew. I never knew. Because <laughs> I'm in the Navy. I'm trained at sea. You know, we were, we were trained that radar had a, I don't know, I'm going to classify the information, but there's limited <laughs> range of radar. Yeah. And we were told that to overcome this range is the E-2 uh, Hawkeye aircraft that would fly and extend the range of the uh, radar back to the aircraft carrier. Sure. Never once were we told about anything about curvature of the Earth. Yeah. Not once. No, no. Why would no? Yeah, nobody, nobody else has been told that either. Apparently. No, it was not part of my training. And the Cornelius yeah. effect um, sounds kind of funny. I learned about it from the Simpsons. <laughs> the Coriolis effect? Yeah, because the Simpsons went like to the south. The south of the equator, and they're in the embassy in the toilet. They're talking oh, about oh yeah, yeah, the toilet. Yeah, yeah and they had the, the, the anti gravity machine to make toilets spin the right way, so you felt at home. <laughs> that, that was the first time I ever heard about the corn. <laughs> I mean, we weren't. I mean, we're talking about aircraft flying around 100 miles per hour, and you would think these things would come into play, but they just don't. Yeah. Um. So anyway, so I set up. I was perplexed. Set my scope to 350 miles, and sure enough, I could see aircraft at 350 miles away, no problem. And I started. You know, we weren't talking about, I didn't know anything about the curved earth. I didn't know about the equation. And I started pulling out my calculator. And I'm like, okay, at, at just 300 miles away, which was a clear radar blimp, mm-hmm. at 350, they got a little fuzzy. Yeah. But we're talking about 81,666 feet. And <sighs> aircraft don't fly that high unless, you know, <laughs> classified mission. Oh, of course. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm reading their airspeed and their altimeters and I dialed it down. I'm watching Boston traffic and, uh, you know, the whole traffic pattern. Cause I'm, you know, I'm interested in that kind of things and how civilians control aircraft. Cause it's a little bit different to the military. Sure. And, and then I'm sitting there going, well, it's impossible according to these equations for me to see the Boston traffic. I shouldn't have been able to see it. Yeah. Yeah, and and you're following it, and and forgive me if I'm I'm giving the wrong terms. Jonathan's probably better at this than I am. So you're following them all the way in to the Boston airport. Oh yeah. So oh, when yeah. they when they got down, and you didn't lose them at any point, as far as you. Well, can see. I, I you know I have to say, uh, 1993 was the last time I sat in front. Oh uh, okay, of well that's show. okay. <laughs> so I, I you know I want to be as true and accurate as possible. Sure. And so, I was not suspicious of anything, so I wasn't like, you know, really watching him. Well, they, no. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't watching their altitude and airspeed, but yeah, I'm watching them hit the ground. Yeah, but the, but the point was, is when you crank that sucker up, now, was that the only time you did it, or was it one of those things where you're... No, all the time. At so, that point, yeah. it's like, oh, I'm just going to turn this thing up whenever I'm bored. Yeah, yeah it kind of begs the argument. I'm sitting there going, well, if, you know, is the radar bound, you know, like ham radio, is, it, is the radar bouncing off the sky? Is it, no, clear day, cloudy day, I don't, I don't care what kind of day it was, you, you could have the worst weather in the world. Yeah, and I could see the whole eastern seaboard, no problem. Wow, 
That's fun. Wow. That's fantastic. Did um, when when you're looking at it, I mean, so uh, there's a couple of questions that come to mind. First of all, why did they why did they cap you at 60 miles normally if the range is is 500 percent greater than that? Oh so, no, it's t- it's all about airspace. You have uh, arrival departure, which is um, 10 miles uh, wide up to 10,000 feet. That airspace. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, you got their traffic control area is five miles out, up to 5,000 feet. Then there's approach after approach is center. So it's basically your wheelhouse. But but the but the equipment you were using was rated for much much higher than that. Yeah, and I had I was blown away. Wow. Wow, that's great. Was was that airport? Uh, you you probably wouldn't know this, but I, I've got to ask. Was do you think the equipment that that was out there? I mean, does a lot do a lot of people have those that type of radar that can that can go out that far? Was was that was that airport used for something much bigger at some point, and then they just had to dial them back? Do you think? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I you know I can just say we we're a Tracom facility. Oh yeah. So you would think our capabilities a little bit more, but I, uh, I, I got you. So because the military was involved, it's like they never underdo anything. So it's well, like, no, we were uh, we controlled five civilian airports. Ah, oh. it, it's a very rare military operation where we controlled civilian air traffic as well. Wow, wow, that's fantastic. That's really really great. So you listen to Jonathan's thing, and uh, and and that just all of a sudden prompted you to to email me. Yeah, because I was like, oh, my God. I mean, all these people would run around trying to prove stuff, and I'm sitting there going, well, I got a hardcore, you know, forget the laser test. I got airport surveillance radar. I got airplanes with, you know, squawking. They got transponders. The way it works, you know, you like your movie, you know, you got this big sweep that goes around the radar screen, and it hits an aircraft, and it pings back to the radar, the altitude and the airspeed, because mm-hmm. um, the radar can't tell you that. It, it's the aircraft delivering that information to us. Yeah. And every time it does a sweep, it pings it, and we get a, a reading. Wow. Wow. That's really good. Cool. Uh, Mark, do you have a question? Oh, dude, you can ask anything. <laughs> Go ahead. So, I, well, you're talking about the uh, being out that far on the distance. You guys were based out on the East Coast there. I, it's up in, I guess, I'm not sure exactly where the... Where the base was that you were at, but uh, well, you know the Kenny Benkport where the president vacations. We can we would uh, Air Force oh. fly through our airspace all the time. That was pretty cool. Okay, by like uh, Portland in that area. Yeah, um, Portland, Bangor, all that, all those airports. Okay, okay. So if you're on the if you're on the water, how far out can you see out of the water that far? Would it shoot three fifty out? You know, out across the Atlantic. Um, let me give my disclaimer. We're not going to discuss any classified information. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, would it, would I guess, go ahead. I'm, cause, okay. cause we had warning areas and we had, you know, secret missions going on. So I don't want to get into that, but, um, I was never told that this is classified information that the radar can go 350 miles. I was not, the, the entire time I was an air traffic controller, I was only involved in one mission where, um, the mission was so obvious. I didn't have the, the, it, 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 the, there's the joke above your pay grade, but it really is true. It was above my pay grade, the mission. But what was happening was just so obvious that we were finally debriefed on what was going on and told this is classified secret. Um, you know, airmen, air crew, air traffic controllers in general, we have a secret security clearance. So I was only involved in one mission where they said, hey, this is classified. But no, I was never told 350 miles is, you know, classified. Wow. Huh. I'd be curious to see how how much that uh, coincides with what we see on uh, the flight radar trackers, you know, when, they're, when the aircraft are dropping off off the coast, how far out they're getting, you know, because, oh, I mean, radar is going to pick them up. You know, if you're picking them up 350, I mean, that's that's a quite a ways off the coast, and a lot of these guys are dropping off pretty quick. So Yeah, good point. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, and and uh, uh, Dale, I'm sure you you watched some of the clue stuff where I was showing in the Southern Hemisphere how when planes would get off. Now, granted, this was this was supposedly the GPS system, uh, and I have to correct uh, myself because I initially said that the GPS system claims to have 24 satellites that are spinning around the globe at all times, but actually, someone corrected me and said, no, no, actually, it's actually it's 36 satellites that are supposedly oh, yeah. spinning all over the place, and even. Even with that, when the the planes that I was watching in the Southern Hemisphere would get 150, maybe 200 miles off the coast, uh, the the uh, latitude and longitude coordinates would just disappear. They would go into approximated or estimated mode, and uh, and then stay on, stay stay gone until it was within like an hour of the 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 destination airport. Mm-hmm. Well, I I never thought to look this up, but on the flat Earth model, that 100 or 200 miles is 
much further, so they're dropping off at our maximum radar range. Oh, you think? That's I just said. Uh, I don't know if they, yeah, some of them are dropping off a lot quicker. I mean, up up in the northern hemisphere, they, they go out, I mean, you're pretty much tracking them all the way across, but down south, a lot of those guys were dropping off once they were within 100 miles from the coast. I mean, yeah, it was pretty close. I saw that too, which was, yeah, which, go ahead. So, so 100 miles on the flat earth, I, I don't have one in front of me. If you do the calculations, I bet 100 miles is more like 400. Oh, you mean on, yeah. down down in the south? Yeah, because according to the flat earth, that. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. The outer ring would be longer. Yeah, that. And, right. But the, so they're they're dropping off according to the unclassified yeah. range of radar. Yeah. If if this yeah if the scale is yeah yep. yeah and and that's perfect because what, what Jonathan I think I think where you're going with this is that uh, is that yeah whatever the limit of the land radar is that's that's it you mm-hmm. you're you're not tracking it although it makes, I never thought of this. What? <laughs> Go ahead. I never thought of this before. Oh, what we're talking about? Yeah, I never, I never crossed my mind. Yeah, yeah. The the land system. Although you got to wonder what they're using to maybe maybe I should do some more research now in the north some of the northern hemisphere flights. Like, what if something's going from San Francisco to Hawaii? You can't tell me it's got total coverage between uh, San Francisco and Hawaii because that plane, those planes don't seem to. And I have not, I have not checked their latitude and longitude. To, to see if the GPS is is pinging back, but I wonder if they're dropping off for even a brief pan, uh, a brief span. They have to. You wonder because I don't think there's anything between those two. Now, when you get out to the you know the South Pacific, there's islands all over the place. Uh, you know, at least outside Japan and and you know near the Philippines and all all that fun stuff and Guam. But uh, there's there's big tracks that uh, shouldn't be uh, yeah shouldn't be laid out. That's well, and if it if it is if it is flat, then obviously you know line of sight, you know that radar can go out quite a quite a ways. And I'm sure that whatever you guys are using is not the best of what they have. I mean, if they can get something set up, I, they've got to be able to do better than that. Yeah. Oh yeah, so they can. yeah. The um the thought was, and I I was talking to uh, different people. I think I was mentioning it with the Air Force guy as well. And I don't know, if, Jonathan, if I was if I was discussing it with you, was that. The, it seems like the old Loran system was never mothballed; that it was just enhanced. And uh, oh, if, I'm sorry, I, I, there was. And uh, Dale, forgive me if if you were the one that told me this. Was that the Loran system got a real boost because they figured out really what they did was they built the GPS system into the receivers, and that's what's that's where the illusion of the GPS system is coming from. Is that uh, it's so. What they did was when processors got got so small that they could build them into, uh, you know, mil- as, you know, the military got a hold of them first, but now you know every phone's got them. That actually the whole GPS system is in your phone. It has nothing to do that. All you have to do is pipe a signal to it, and the phone itself would, would simulate it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, so, that would me, but it's probably the uh, Australian guy. Oh right. Yep. The Australian guy. Yeah. Good. I, would, I would love to. Go tour the engineering department at Garmin. <laughs> that would, uh, I think, that would uh, get get a few answers. Yeah, 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 definitely. So let, let me let me ask this, Dale. So now that now that you see, so let me let me recap real fast. You you looked at the flat Earth, and because we're going to come in coming up on break here in a few minutes, but you were looking at the flat Earth for a while in the beginning, but way back in April, May. Oh, six or eight months ago, I'm bad. Six, six, six or eight months ago, and then you got frustrated. weren't buying it. We're not buying it. Got out, and then all of a sudden, it just took this one little thing, and it's like it clicked for you. Yeah, it took Jonathan Walker. That's hardcore proof. Yeah, number one, and then number two, it clicked. Oh my god, I was an air traffic controller. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm seeing these things. <laughs> um, we and, go and break in two minutes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah roughly. Go oh, ahead, so. Though. I don't know if I should wait till after the break, but why? What do you got? An interesting thing is uh, the the approach controller. One day he was uh, training new, and he pointed out to me, "Oh my God, look! You can see that aircraft on the ground!" And he's flipping out because this airplane's forty miles away. Okay, and you know most of the time buildings, airports have buildings around them. We got trees and stuff, and we just started noticing that we could always see the airplanes on the ground. You know because they they check in for flight advisories. It's a civilian airport I'm talking about. Okay. And they check in for flight advisories. We tell them to squawk. And, you know, we're seeing the blimp going, this is impossible. And then they squawk, and we're seeing the squawk on the ground. We're watching taxi, and 
you know, and everybody's like tripping out, going, "How could this be? How is this possible?" So you, yeah, you're confirming it's not like it, it's not like you're you're seeing a weird ghost image on the radar, and then right. you, because they're actually confirming audio wise, they're 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 when you say squawk, you mean that they're calling it in. Um, no, the yeah, the ahead, aircraft John. actually, the aircraft on the aircraft side of things, we have a, a box called the transponder, yeah. and it just basically communicates with their radar unit. So when we get pinged by the radar that transponder picks up that signal and then broadcasts our information back out to it. So when we squawk, that's us sending the signal back out to the radar. Got it. Okay, good thing I clarified because I completely, I was, I was thinking the other way where, you know, like, like the, the pilots always, you know, call in with this and that information. They, they probably think we squawk, but no. <laughs> <laughs> good laugh for the break. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, we, no, we got, we got, we got a minute. So when, when we come back, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, but just to, just to, uh, reiterate the, what, do you remember what airport this was? That was 40 miles away right by, by, by chance. The name? Um, I, I, I'm, I mean, we had like, I'm, I'm you had a bunch. Like, like we had a Augusta rings a bell and Bangor and, but this was one that was 40 miles away and well within... Well, your- let's just say for the critics that might be listening, at 20 miles away, the, uh, the, the surveillance, the airport surveillance radar is at 252 feet. Yeah. So you do the equation, you can take 266 feet minus 252. At 20 miles, the aircraft had to be 14.6 feet below the curvature of the... Sure. Yeah. And that's 20 miles. That's just at 20. Yeah. And at 40, if I'm not mistaken, uh, yeah. we got... Yeah, a lot further. 60 seconds. Let me, let me punch this up real fast because I've got the chart and maybe I'll, well, you guys, I'm not, I'm not going to have you read it while you're, while you're on with me because I don't want to lose the connection. But uh, at, let's see. Yeah, 20 miles. Yeah, 266 feet. At 40 miles, though, it goes way, way up. So it's between 20 and 40. Like 30 miles, it's up to 600 feet. And at 40 miles. Minus 252. At 30 miles? Now you have to minus the height of the Oh, radar. yeah, yeah, minus 252, yeah. And uh, at 40 miles, minus two, uh, before, before the minus, it's almost 1,100 feet, which, yeah. which is a lot. And you can, you're wow. watching this thing the whole way. Oh, yeah, and I, I'm pretty convinced it's 40 miles away. Wow. All right. So uh, when we come back from the break, we are going to continue our discussion with Dale, uh, the flight controller and our special guest Jonathan Walter from Walter Aviation out of Iowa. Who, uh, and by the way, uh, Jonathan, you haven't you haven't changed your opinion, have you? Uh, no, no. Per- perfect. All right, <laughs> we come back. We'll keep talking to these guys about uh, flat Earth and airplanes and everything about them. Don't go anywhere. Waking up the masses with Robert Bruce, Monday through Thursday, on Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome back to Strange World, where the truth is often stranger than fiction. We're talking flat Earth once again because hey, that's what I do. And with us tonight, subject matter show, we've got an air traffic controller named Dale. Dale, are you still with us? Yes. Can you hear me? Fantastic. And we've got a special guest and returning guest, uh, John. Not much, but it really, but it does reinforce the. Uh, uh, the GPS system. And, and some people have yeah. said, well, and, and it's going to crush the people that have said, well, because I've, I've gotten emails where uh, people have, have messaged me or called me and, and said, well, that's in the Southern Hemisphere. That's what the GPS does because there's no coverage down there. Uh, I'm going, well, why, why would you call it a global positioning system? Why would you even use the word? It's not a partial positioning system or a land positioning system. It's global. Plus, it's the United States military with not 24 folks, but 36 satellites that are supposedly spinning all over the place. The, the, the DOD doesn't do anything small. And if they could have overlapping blanket coverage, that's exactly what they would do. And, and, and by the way, that also reinforces um, that point that you brought up, Jonathan, some time ago, that why there's dead spots in the um, 
uh, and then it, where where you get where you are, where you said there'd be like dead spots in the GPS system for no apparent reason over land. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. Anyway, let's while he's doing his thing, Dale. <laughs> what? Uh, what, what were what, when we left here? You were talking about tracking planes on the ground. Oh, by the way, and I've got I've got to add something to that because I just thought of this, which was um, at twenty something miles away, you, you're tracking planes on the ground with a with a, with a radar. Now, granted, the the radar's up a little ways, but the thing is, that radar still would have to be kind of sneaking over the curve. It's not like it's got a whole bunch of room to play with if there's if there's a uh, curve to the globe, right? Yeah, at 20 miles, it's 14 feet. Yeah, know? I mean, it, 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 you're really going to get full. It's not going to be spotty. It's not going to break up, you know, when you're sneaking over the curve and looking at it like at an airport that far away. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah you're, I think you're dead on. So anyway, sorry. So you were saying. I can't remember the story I was going to tell before. The uh, something about a supervisor. You were looking at a plane that was on the ground at another airport. That... Um, well, yeah, but basically the, the you know the approach controller is just completely freaking out that we can see airplanes on the ground because usually you know there's buildings around the airport that get in the way. There's trees, and usually they have to take off. And right when they get about you know 50 feet in the air, then then we can see the transponder. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Good points. I mean, yeah. There's buildings all over the place, and, and... you know, but, but how do we see? You know, but but occasionally, you know, the radar apparently peeked through the buildings and stuff, and you know, <clears throat> um, and I mean, Augusta, Augusta was twenty six miles away, and this airport was forty miles away, which is why the, the approach control was completely freaking out. <laughs> you know. Wow. So, was there in in that type of airport? Was there uh, was there a lot of downtime, or was it just every once in a while? A lot. Get... Yeah, a lot of down, downtime. So you guys would kind of play with this and that, but you probably like any anybody. I mean, you were there for years and years, and and uh, Jonathan, same sort of thing. Like, and and you fly, by the way. Um, I don't have a license, but I've flown. I actually got to go to go up with the. Um... So you're an illegal pilot. It's it's. Ha! No, I'm not a legal pilot. There's a license pilot running. in the cockpit, yeah. obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got to go with the Blue Angels once. I went up and found Albert during an air show with the. Oh, nice. The the assisted jet takeoff, JTOL, they call it. It was a assisted, I forgot the abbreviation. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, that thing went, I just love how they didn't brief us. And the cargo <laughs> plane, you're sitting sideways. And these guys in the back of the plane, I'm like, what they're doing? Nobody what's going on. And all of a sudden we take off, boom, the jets kick in. And these guys are against their once they're on the floor. Now they're on the ceiling and, I, and I'm in my seatbelt totally sideways. My my feet are just about touching my 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 hands and, and we're just flying straight up in the air. And I was told as a 3G takeoff, which is equivalent to my understanding, the space shuttle. Oh, so I experienced yep, yep. the same takeoff as a space shuttle. And boy, did that ripped me apart. And then all of a sudden the, the jet engines go out and they're. You know, the guys are back going, hey, you know, they're going, yeah, w- w- whatever. They're saying the engine, the, the, you know, the jets are extinguished. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, boom, weightlessness. Oh, my God. What an amazing feeling. <laughs> we were completely weightless, floating around, hair in the air. I mean, it probably lasted 10 seconds, but it felt like an hour. It was the most amazing feeling in my life. And then we do this bank and there's 90,000 people at the air show that day. And I'm, and I'm looking at my window, but I'm looking straight down at the ground. And, you know, we do all these crazy maneuvers and then land. And I was like, oh, my, I can't believe that just happened. Uh, <laughs> you sound just like one of my aerobatic ride passengers. That, uh, oh, boy. Summer, yeah. I probably throw up my <laughs> instruments. You'd be wiping them off. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I didn't know. You, I'm sorry. You, you take people for joy rides? Yeah, I'm actually. In, we do aerobatic thrower flights. Uh, I'm an aerobatic instructor for the the my company here, where I, what I teach. So, part of what I do is actually taking pilots up and teaching them to do advanced uh, maneuvers with the airplane for for safety, not just to be like an airshow pilot, yeah. not for stunts. But yeah, and we'll yeah. take it, roll the airplane upside down, do loops, rolls, you know, all the fun stuff. So, oh, cool. Yeah, cool. Not just to dodge UFOs or anything like that. No, no, you know, I, you know, I, I have to say I liked your intro there, uh, but unfortunately, Iowa must be like the one place that UFOs don't visit. I, I don't know anybody in Iowa that's seen a UFO like in Iowa. It's everywhere else, but really, we're just a we're just a really boring state or something. I don't know. Wow, <laughs> that's that's really well. Well, okay, so you have you have never seen one, but uh, what what about you, Dale? You ever seen anything funny? Uh, I've been waiting for this question. 
Oh, I gotta ask. I mean, it's okay. Well, okay, I know. Let, no, no, let me, no, no, let me, no, 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 no. Let me, let me give the disclaimer first, and that is, I am a huge believer. I was not, you know, I had never seen anything that was really weird in the skies, and then I watched that. You know, some people already know this story. I had watched or some video where a British guy at the very end, of the video, the, 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 it was a general conspiracy stuff, aliens, and I wasn't really that excited about the whole thing. But he gets to the end. He goes, he goes, you want to see something interesting? Get yourself a pair of night vision yeah, goggles. It, yeah, it, exactly. And start looking up. And I'm just going oh, right on. I am totally going to do that. So I, you know, I three thousand dollars, and if you hit light, they're destroyed. Well, you can get them cheaper than that. I mean, you can get Gen ones for I don't know four hundred bucks. But still, and, you hit light. And just... Well, yeah, you got to be careful. Yeah, you don't want to. You're absolutely right, though. Yeah, you don't want to fry them. And I was very, very careful about these things because yeah, they're not. They're, it's not like they're binoculars. They're oh, the basic... things you'll see with those would just. Like make flat earth seem like kindergarten. Well, no, 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 not at all. Um, I but I looked at these things because they'd fly, these things fly the least the things I saw, uh, flew up so high. You know, they were at least eighty, hundred thousand feet. That and and they were they were silent and they were you know they were moving in all sorts of different directions. But what I was going to get at was when I was looking at them the first night because I, I you know it, it's really not to use a cliche but it's night and day you put these things on you're looking up there and, the, fr- and the first thing you, you see is is the sky there's so many things moving up there and you're going tons, no, tons of stuff I was going um, well, well it's not like I go I, I first first comment is like wow there's a lot of damn satellites up there mm-hmm. I had a lot of satellites and, and and I had heard rumors that there was a bunch of satellites. I was going, okay. And then I'm I'm getting bored pretty quick. I was but going, they're okay. not satellites. Yeah, they're not satellites. I'm looking. I'm going. I watch this satellite supposedly just slow down and stop, and then it just sits there like it's lost. And then it just makes kind of a slow left hand turn, and then picks up speed really fast and goes ballistic. And then I mean, like out of sight, all without a, a single sound. I mean, there was a couple yeah. of flashes here and there, but you couldn't see it with the naked eye. And this no, happened. Yeah. This happened all the time. And I was going, I was going. Okay, so what exactly am I looking at? So now the answer, and I know people uh, think I'm being a smartass when I do it. When they say, "Oh, well, you know, flat Earth. What about satellites?" I go, "Really? Who told you they were satellites? Who? Wh- what exactly makes you think they're satellites? Just because somebody said, oh, yeah, by the way, we got satellites up there. You're buying it.' It's like, well, we see lights in the sky.' I go, "Yeah, you've seen something, but I don't. D- whatever I've seen, cert- certainly aren't satellites, and they aren't us." So, so so anyway, do you do you believe you know? Give me give me your take on it. You, you can say you know pass if you want if you don't want to. Well, get, before I forget, though, um, I can't remember the guy's name, but I, was, I meant to look this up because I, I knew this was going to come up. What? Um, he he has the the expensive three thousand dollar you know binoculars, and he yeah. shines uh, a beam in the sky, some type of. Oh, oh I know which guy you're talking about. Yeah, and and it attracts these things. Thank you. <laughs> things. <laughs> these objects. And not only that, um, no, it's, I mean, oh boy, um, I gotta think here for a minute how to say this. Cause I'm, it's all right. Take your time. I, I don't want to cross the line. Um, well, when I'm sorry, when what, is this a military matter that you don't want to? Well, the, this this guy will show um, beings <clears throat> on the ground that are not necessarily oh. that you would see with your normal eyes. Oh, I got you. Oh, you, oh, you mean uh, so if you take your night vision and focus it on the Yeah, earth. and then he, you know, and then he, these um, basically things come in that look like aircraft and, you know, they're, they're uh, here, let me give you a parable. It's kind of like, um, I'm trying to think of doing, if you're going hunting and somebody's looking for a deer. Yeah. And these things are like scouting for stuff and then they find something and then they go do their thing. Oh, I got you. Recon. Yeah, and you're you're seeing those through the night vision or on the scope. Yeah, you can see with night vision, no problem. It's easy. Oh, oh my god, it's ridiculous. Are you were you referencing any of these with the scope at the same time by any chance? Um. Okay. Well, I'll go there. <laughs> you might as well. <laughs> we're going down that road. Um, because well. these things can't sometimes. Yeah, I'm just giving you know some of this. Sometimes they can be picked up radar, and sometimes they can't. Yeah. Well, my my, my understanding is they can't, which is just blew my mind when we had one instant yeah um again bored late at night seems like where all these stories begin <laughs> the uh approach it was only three of us in the red room, the approach controller and, and two of us and just by weird coincidence we were all we were all looking at the approach controller's uh scope and this thing went flying across across the uh 
scope? <sighs> it's hard for me to talk about this. Um, the scope, awesome. and it was two football fields wide and two fi- football fields long, and the radar signature was that of an aircraft identing. Now, Jonathan might be able to go into more details. Wait. 1993, so it's like talking about air traffic control stuff, but ident makes basically wait, when an wait, aircraft... Wait, wait. You had a foot. You had a foot thing of those two football fields wide by long that idented on your radar. Yeah, what's idented? Somebody what? tell me. Okay, that's that's basically so to to confirm contact with the target. The air traffic controller will ask the pilot to ident, and basically on that transponder box that I was talking about earlier, there's an ident button. We push the ident button, and it and it actually makes the transponder instantaneously send out a signal, basically light up and flash up, so that it it on the controller's screen. That pilots or that aircraft will light up compared to everyone else, so he knows that that's you. Does that make sense? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this thing actually. This thing said, "Oh yeah, yeah." You've sold, well, I'm sold. not saying. I'm not saying it was identing. I'm saying it. it the radar it was, signature was so bright. Yeah, it, that it was, it was equivalent. as if it was. It wasn't squawking or. Oh, thank God. You scared me for a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the radar signature was just so bright. It was. The illumination was three times of an ident. Wow! Oh, geez. and it and you know the scope um, was set to 100 miles, and so it covered 100 miles in the blink of an eye, which puts it around 400,000 miles per hour. Wow! 400,000? No, 4,000. Do the math. Blink of an eye. And how big was the scope? 100 miles. Good lord! I did the math. I am. I could be wrong. Well, no. I mean, if if hundred miles in a fraction of a second, yeah, yeah, that would so, be extremely fast. Yeah, like four hundred thousand miles per hour. Wow. Well, it could have engaged whatever. Um, uh, I like to call them the 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 unified field engines at that point, because uh, where in if anyone doesn't know what a U, unified field engine is, that's the the mythical or legendary whatever you want to call it uh, engine that supposedly powers these things, which is the balanced equation between gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. Uh, and the theory behind that is, and supposedly Einstein knew, but he was never going to give it up to the military because he saw what they did with atomic weapons, was that if you could balance the equation between electromagnetic and gravitational waves, you can create an aircraft, or whatever you want to call it, an aircraft as good as anything, but it would work underwater and just about anywhere else, mm-hmm. that, uh, that could travel at all, almost unbelievable speeds with uh, extremely fast acceleration and no G-forces. To, to, to speak of. But, but this reminds me, because you were talking about something that was that big and that wide. Uh, I'm sorry, that long and that wide. And that reminds me of, uh, if anyone knows about this one, is the, uh, the 1986 uh, Japan cargo plane incident. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah. if anyone hasn't heard about that one, uh, you guys have. But on the air, where uh, this Japan, Japan cargo plane was. I can't believe you went public with it. Well, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's what sunk. Him. And and of course the picture they use of him was so flattering, you know. He's got that crazy eye, and he's kind of showing, you know, with his hands how oh, the plane. They make him all look crazy. Oh yeah, but but there was this uh, 747 cargo plane flying, uh, you know, back to the states, and it was going by Alaska, and he had a giant, you know, what was it, 600 feet by 600 feet, like a walnut shaped aircraft. He said it was several times bigger than an aircraft carrier that seemed to have some interest in him and was tailing him. And so, you know, he got a little bit concerned because that he was it was much bigger than a 747, which, you know, was the flagship of the day. And uh, he decided to, to call the Air Force base ahead. And so they had him do. And they said, yeah, we absolutely see this thing on radar. So here, do a couple of maneuvers. So they had him do, you'll have to forgive me uh, if I butcher this, uh, like a couple slow circles, either left hand, either clockwise or counterclockwise to see if he could lose them. You know, like either they would go by or would follow him, and it followed him uh, to the point where the, he couldn't he couldn't ditch him, obviously. So eventually, he just they they were going to scramble jets, and he goes, "Look, I'll, I'm just going to keep on my approach." And eventually, the thing veered off and uh, and left. But yeah, when he hit the ground, of course, he was so excited that he told the press, and that was it. He had a desk job for the rest of his very short career. <laughs> he uh, he didn't get to uh, and I, I I reference him when I said that you would be better off talking about uh, having a, having that when I when I said that in the clues when I said if, if you think that that talking about uh, flat Earth is bad it's it's worse than 
going to your boss and saying that you had a UFO follow you for several hours and when you landed and, and making an official report about it, that that's how bad it is. You go, if you go to your boss mm-hmm. from a, you know, if you're a professional pilot and you go to your boss and say, Oh yeah, by the way, I think the maps are wrong because I think the earth is flat. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll send you in for counseling. Yes. Yep. At that point. So anyway, sorry, I, 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 I completely digress. So this thing, this, oh, this, let me, before I forget. So, um, when this happened, the, uh, the approach controller turned around, who was also the facility watch supervisor. She's in charge of the whole facility. Yeah. She turns around, her, her you know, pardon the expression, mouth to the floor, eyes wide open. She goes, did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> and, my, you know, I, you know I, I'm a I'm low-ranking low guy at this time. And I looked at the guy next to him. We both looked at each other and we looked at her and we said, yeah. <laughs> and that was the end of it. But it was, but it was so fast. I mean, I'm sure you guys kind of waved it off, at least initially, as as uh, a mechanical thing, right? It's like, well, the scope must be. Well, no, we're not trained for that. We we didn't, you know, we, we're not trained to call it NORAD and go, hey, there's a. Do you have anything going on in your area that's that's gigantic? Let's well, we had an incident where that did happen, but um, that was more ruled out civilian aircraft. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, you mean like a spy plane type of thing? No, um, we, we had an. Well, I was also a base operations manager. Um, we, we, I was per, part of search and rescue. Um, you know, we're we're tied in the whole you know eastern seaboard. Um, when you know when things go wrong, um, I, I coordinate search and rescue missions. Yeah. Um, that was one of my jobs. You know, as a, it, it's not, not tower radar; it's space operations. Yeah. And, you know, we file flight plans and yada yada. And, um, you know, we, we had an instance once, uh, you know, all the law enforcement's, ha- everyone has our phone number, and our phone just blew up. I mean, I had state police, sheriff, <laughs> local police. I had everyone calling me, um, asking, you know, what the heck's going on because uh, civilians reported a aircraft flying overhead, knocking out all the power on the, for 200 miles on the eastern seaboard. Straight well, out of close encounters in the third kind. Well, no, it's yeah. the we, we, we have the radar jamming uh, aircraft. Boy, the A-6, is it? I'm going to go blank on it. Yeah. Um, well, everybody knows in, in Desert Shield and Storm, the first thing they do is they fly these aircraft in and they knock out all the power. We saw Baghdad yeah. power go dead. Remember that? Okay, yeah, with, uh, with uh, localized pulses. No, it's it's the aircraft that does that. No, no, but I mean, is it a localized EMP? It, you, but you'll use radiation. Oh, okay, cool. It has a a, a foot um, a foot. It it has lead that's a foot in depth in front of the pilot, the protect, protected from the radiation. I don't know if I should say this part, but I think it's unclassified. Sure. The canopy has real gold in it to um, protect itself from the radiation. Now, it's really, really hard to find a picture of this aircraft. Sure. I, I don't think, I don't know if one exists. I, I was on aircraft carrier, so I, I saw it. And when the sun sign sh- shines just right, the canopy turns gold. I mean, <laughs> like a gold bar. Wow. Like, this, this thing is set up for major radiation. We had an, I think I can talk about this. Um, we had an incident once where the um, this aircraft accidentally Flipped the switch and turned on his radar ra- um, radar jamming equipment. Uh oh! Um, radiated the guy in front of him, and the the, the air, you know the that guy died of radiation poison. But no, no doubt. Well, yeah. I mean, if the canopy, I've, I've, seriously, twelve inches of, of lead shielding. Yeah. Well, good lord, that's that's. Well, I hope that's unclassified. <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, well, no. I've said several times that because uh, I had to deal with the Van Allen radiation belt problem, and that is, there's only two. Most people know that that lead is a really good shield against radiation. We all use it when we go to the dentist. But what's even more effective is gold. Gold well, is. Well, uh, you can see through gold because they the canopy had gold in it, so you can yeah. still see through it. But the gold would protect you. Yeah, yeah. Gold is literally um, almost twice as heavy as lead, and most people don't know that. We, we, you joke about it in the movies where it's like, "Yo, this gold bar is heavy." It's like, yeah, it's twice as heavy as lead. Lead is heavy, and uh, mm-hmm. but nobody nobody ever holds a big chunk of gold, so you never know, you know. But I'm sure uh, prospectors did back in the day. Um, uh, real quick before we go to break, because we got a, a minute or so, I want to I want to say this real quick about the because uh, I watched a movie recently, uh, Bridge of Spies. I, I downloaded it. it was about the U two spy plane that was shot down and how they yeah, negotiated the plane. Yeah. Got it out. But what I was trying to tell people as far as uh, uh, spy planes go, people forget of as far as keeping secrets in the military, and that is until we had a spy plane shot down, we didn't have a spy plane. 
they called it, and I, I listened to this in the movie, where they called it, even when they announced it before the Russians paraded the pilot around, they called it a NASA plane. <laughs> who had gone <laughs> off course. And like, again, remember, NASA was, this was 1960, NASA wasn't even two years old. It's like, really? A NASA plane went off course? And then um, we didn't have another spy plane that replaced it until the SR-71 was retired. It's like, oh yeah, we're retiring the SR-71. Like, what are you talking about? You have another yeah. spy plane? And then they asked and said, okay, what are you going to replace the SR-71 with? And they said, oh, nothing. <laughs> like, yeah, of course. You're of course. killing me. So now we and, got... and, and then the pilot didn't kill himself, which he should have. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Where, yeah, he should have. Yeah, he probably should have. I'm a military man. That that pilot, he was a yeah. disgrace. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we come <laughs> back more flight instructor and flight controller. We are now tuned into the Truth Frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome back to Strange World. I'm your host, Mark Sargent. And with me, we've got Dale, a flight controller, and returning with us is Jonathan Walter from Walter Aviation. You guys both still here? Yeah. Um, yes, and I need to clarify, I was an air traffic controller, not a flight controller. Oh, air traffic controller. Sorry. Air That's traffic. okay. Some people, the flight controller is something different. Got it. No, I know. It's why you're the subject matter. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, many people think I was the guy on the, the flight deck holding up the flags, you know, letting the plane know if they're left or, you know, the wings are dipping. And no, that's not me. Got it. <laughs> you, you, you were that, but you crashed too many of those. And so. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're very funny, Mark. Very funny. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's asking you directions. You're using the flags to point them. It's like, no, no, over there. That over was there. never an air traffic controller. Okay. I don't what? want to say where we are in the ship, but no, we're, we're, we're radar. Got it. Okay. Wait, I'm sorry. So so you weren't a flight controller. You were an air traffic controller. I was an air traffic controller. Got it. Okay. No, it's perfectly fine. No, it's, yeah, that's FAA I, certified. You're okay. Here we go. Uh, before we um, uh, get to our thing, because there was a couple th- – we've got chat stuff that's coming off from you guys. Uh, you told me to remind you of the United States Air Force Alaska radar station. Um, I'm not comfortable talking about that this time. Maybe okay, let's do the chat room. Oh no, 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 not chat room. It was just I was just reading through the notes that you guys had. Uh, oh no, no, I'm not going to ask this chat room because the chat room um, usually dis- distracts me. But you don't have to talk about that. I'm not. I, I would. I. I can't. That's to, okay. It was a side story anyway. I, I, I want to talk about it. I don't know if it'll feel comfortable. I, well, it comes um, up. The, the preface is. Um, I'll just tell the preface. I won't go into the material. Uh-huh. Um, I ran into uh, a person I knew very well, so he was legit, and he was stationed um, in Alaska, and his job was to, uh, he's a radar controller, and his job was to protect the United States of aircraft flying in through Alaska. Mm-hmm. And from there, he told me a story that he never said, hey, this is classified. Okay. Uh, what the heck? I'll just say it. Oh, come on. Yeah. I'll say it. I'll say it. Um, it's like, you can always change your mind. I can edit it. 
Well, it, are we live on the air? <laughs> I guess we, we Yes, we are. But, uh, but that's okay. We, we don't have that. I mean, we have some people listening, but more people listen to us after the fact. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, the, the radar, <laughs> I don't want to go into the capabilities of the radar. Okay. Um, I'm, you can I'm, use words like far or long. It, we went really <laughs> far out. Okay, it's a long distance radar. A very long distance, and his job was to not only protect America from you know whatever Russian aircraft coming in, blah blah blah. Yeah. But his main job, his his number, you know, your mission priority, number one mission priority was to track aircraft coming in through the North Pole, and and to watch them come into through the North Pole down through Alaska into the United States. He would track them all throughout the uh, United States. And he, his job was to make sure that they went up through Alaska, out the North Pole, and left. Okay. And he was not his, – his direct orders were not to notify anybody, just track them. The only time he used to sound the alert is if an air – if one of these – I hate the word UFO because anything you can't identify sure. as a UFO. Yeah. But if one of these objects – I'm more comfortable saying Yeah, no, object's a good word. If yeah. one of these objects – didn't leave, then he noticed, notified his commanding officer, then NORAD was notified, then there was a full-blown, you know, sortie mission. Yeah, scramble. they, they, yeah. they scrambled and they went after the guy like, you know, the Russians are here. Yeah. Why not? Because that's the first thing you're supposed to think of. Yeah. Whatever the object is. But we, we're both, scra- you know, before I could say it, he's scratching his head. It's like, why the heck am I tracking aircraft that we don't identify coming into the United States through the North Pole, which is a no-fly zone, Yeah, through Alaska into America. I'm tracking them all throughout the country, and I just have to make sure they leave. And he's going, this, I see he's scratching his head going, Wait I, don't, a minute. I don't get it. Wait a minute. I know where you're going with this. Seriously? Is that what you're kind of hinting at? Is that- The government knows. It's, it's that, wait, his whole, his whole job was to track objects, whether they have a, a call sign or not. None of them had a call sign. Okay, so he's exclusively tracking objects that have no call signs? Coming in from... Just one area, the North Pole. Halfway between here and the moon. What, uh, what elevations was he rated to, to monitor? <laughs> oh, how I don't so these things were coming. He told me halfway between here and the moon is when he could pick them up. And of course, now we know the moon isn't as far away as we think it is. So they right. were coming in from. And that might be more feasible. <laughs> yeah, there you go. yeah, yeah. They're coming in from very high altitudes. They're coming in. De- they're coming down through uh, the North Pole. North Pole, going flying over the states, and he just had to make so just make sure they they they. He, that they're not doing anything well as far as we know they're not doing anything funny and then they turn around and, and go back and he just has to make sure that they leave that they disappear off his scope and he doesn't have to worry about them anymore yeah and and this is um boy this is um in the 90s yeah <clears throat> he track um about 10 a week oh okay so it's not like the skies were full of them it's not like men in black scenario well that's the- when he's on duty I, I didn't i didn't ask him when he was on duty what the hours i didn't i didn't go into details oh I was blown away he, when he told me that. He didn't, you know, like, again, he didn't say this is classified information. Yeah. So I'm not, like I said, I don't ever divulge classified information, but, you know, he's, you but, know. But if they didn't leave in a timely manner, they would eventually, if they had lingered. Oh, he, NORAD is, was notified. Yeah, and then they'd scramble. Scramble. scramble full, <laughs> yeah. Like, and like, not, that they, not that they could do anything anyway, but they were, they were, that's protocol. You have to scramble, and you got you to gotta send them that wow. That's really that's really cool stuff. I dig it. I really dig it. That's fantastic. Interesting. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, quick and, and a tor- horrible segue. I'm going to do it because I'm I'm looking at your notes, Jonathan. And that is, yeah. uh, you wanted to mention. Did you have something you wanted to kind of chime in about satellite photos versus aerial photography? Or, uh, yeah. or, was, or was it a question? No, no. I yeah, I just had a couple of comments on that. Um, I yeah, we can we can go that route. Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, I guess. Regarding satellites, I've seen a couple people come out and saying, you know, talking about, well, how do satellites take, you know, photos of the Earth? Because we have the photos, you know, yep. everybody can get on Google Earth and look at it. And uh, I, I personally know uh, probably, you know, at least a dozen or more pilots that have had a career of any duration doing aerial photography. Yeah. And 
the aircraft fly, you know, anywhere from a thousand feet off the ground up to 40,000 feet, uh, 30, 30,000 feet, I guess probably is more realistic. Yeah. And, and they have very expensive cameras that do aerial photography. Sure. Now, just for, just to kind of back up that whole concept, they, they could go out and do like, I know, for example, the state of Indiana, they could do the whole state of Indiana in say a month or two. Mm-hmm. Um, they would usually take a couple airplanes and they could basically give you a complete map, Google Earth map, uh, from you know within a matter of a couple months. So the feasibility of actually you know getting current data and images, I think, is certainly well within reason using oh, yeah. aircraft. And uh, something I came across, I just pulled it up here. I want to mention this. Mm-hmm. Um, I as I was looking into all this, I found a uh, it's it's Alaska. It's called AlaskaMapped.org, and uh, I was looking through there, and I was looking through high altitude photography. And this is a website with dealing with Alaska high altitude photography. And right on their right on the website, on their and they're discussing this project. They said that uh, and this is a quote from the website that much of Alaska was fo- fo- uh, photographed from high altitude U two and ER two aircraft between 1978 and 1986 yeah. under a multi state uh, multi agency state and federal partnership. Uh, you know, I mean, right there, they're telling you that they are using high altitude U two spy planes to do oh, yeah. the aerial photography, and uh, they they did like ninety percent of the state, and they said that's like the last time they've ever um, mapped the whole state. Yeah. Now, if we have satellites, why are we not? Why is that? You know? Yeah, excellent point. No, so, anyway. yeah, pe- people do not understand. We've never thrown away the U two. It is too good a plane. It is it is too efficient to to just scrap. You know, it's basically you you guys know better than anybody. I mean, it's a glider with a big engine on it. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it can fly extremely high for long durations, and it can take great pictures. Yep. So why in the world would you get rid of it? I mean, we don't. Yeah, the military gets rid of stuff that they consider obsolete, uh, but there's some things they hang on to for a long time. Uh, the perfect example would be the um, the M2 machine gun. That mm-hmm. thing that thing's been around what since the 40s, and it's in fact earlier than the 40s, and it's a you know, 50 caliber machine gun that's mounted on jeeps and tanks. It, they're still using it today. It's because the design was so good that uh, they, why, they, there was nothing they could replace it with. Now, with the U-2, yeah, it, now they've changed its role, what they could do with the U-2. So taking pictures, that's one thing. So the SR-71 took a different role, and then whatever the Aurora is doing now, who knows what they're using with that thing yeah, for. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, if anyone ever catches a picture of Aurora, you know, there's people willing to pay cash money for a picture of that thing. Uh, but nobody, as far as I know, has taken a shot. Um, Anyway, but, but the the nay the naysayers are going to talk about the SR seventy one aircraft. Oh, and say that uh, the SR seventy one is. Uh... Yeah, I mean, aircraft have a shelf life. I mean. Oh yeah, I, sure. I mean, the, oh, yeah. I, my opinion, the U two is gone. The, the SR seventy one is gone. They got something more advanced. Oh yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. sure, but but they, they, they have a shelf life. But as far as well, of course they got a shelf life. But they do like to hang on to things that uh, that that work well for them, at least for certain for certain tasks. Uh, yeah. But but as, what was Jonathan was saying is that is. It, because people have said, well, you know, it's the satellites that take the picture. It's like, no, 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 no. We've no. got so many aircraft flying around at various altitudes. It would take nothing to yeah. map the world and and yeah. and give the data. And and it, even just using civilian aircraft, you could yeah. get enough data to feed Google Earth. Not to mention what declassified things the military could give them. Well, yeah, the state of Alaska was photographed with a U two. Yeah, the ninety percent of the state of Alaska back in seventy eight through eighty six. I mean, you yeah. know, yeah, 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 it's feasible. It's it's well. Within being feasible. Absolutely. Hey, uh, well, segue back to your uh, radar comments uh, with uh, Dale. Um, over the break, I checked uh, doing some more radar tracking, and uh, go figure. I, I think this is new, and I would like to put this out there for anyone that can can confirm this. But you know, this is a thing that I use on a daily basis, and it always used to track aircraft in the northern hemisphere across the Atlantic. Yeah. And I'm no longer picking up anybody. All the all the flights across the Atlantic are now estimated once they leave the coast. That's like that's a whole new change on the system, as far as I'm. Unless I'm just forgetting how this whole thing worked. Because um, you, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Say, you you used to be able to constant to track all the way across the Atlantic. From, you know, they go up over the coast of uh, New Brunswick in that area, and then across and over to the England, and you could track them, and it would have the actual data. Now uh, that's all showing. It just says estimated all the way across. So that's new. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I would love to see if somebody could find a track, if they had a record where they could show the track of it actually being tracked 
and giving its position uh, across the North Atlantic. And then, by the way, uh, Dale, I did the measurements right now where all these aircraft are dropping off, and it's all exactly pegging out about 200, I'd say two to 300 miles off the coast um, of the Northeast, uh, North America there. So yeah, that's map. fitting right in with what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, and yeah on a globe map they are. So, yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah, yeah. well, and but 200 miles in the north, but in the south, much shorter because because it's the because the miles are off, because, right? Because the yeah. scale's off. Yes, exactly. Right. Yep. Yeah, wow. these are going out two, three hundred miles before they cut off. So, wow. Yeah. Anyway, wow. Interesting. Great. Yeah. Great stuff. I uh, think we create a new video. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody. <laughs> well, I don't know if I'm going to do a new clue because of it, but definitely somebody can can yeah. can modify. I know there's a couple of guys out there that are that really just spend a lot of time on the uh, on the radars. You know, where on the on the GPS system database that everybody's tied into. Yeah. Uh, but hey, I got a, a question for actually both you guys real quick, which is uh, something because if I if I don't, I should have written it down. I would have remembered it earlier. But there was something I had heard years ago, which was because we're kind of delving into uh, you know the curvature of the Earth, and then are there objects flying around up there, which I, I firmly believe there are because I've seen them. But I had always heard that the commercial aircraft used to fly back in the day. Uh, you know, used to get upwards of around you know forty eight thousand, pushing fifty thousand feet every once in a while to get to deal with weather. And now they don't do that anymore. And there was a there was a book, and I can't remember the name of the book. Kind of like something to the effect of str- the strange things above fifty thousand feet. That there were too many pilots reporting weird stuff above 50,000 feet, and uh, when I started doing business travel in the late 90s, early 2000s, planes didn't fly that high anymore. They, they Everything you guys know, I mean, they're capped out at, what, 30-something thousand usually. Bar- yeah, barely. Well, I, I'm, 30 to 40, yeah. From yeah, 40 I, tops. yeah, I haven't seen 40 even in a while. I mean, yeah, I've seen yeah. 38, 39, yeah. but I haven't even, like, it's like, apparently when you hit 40, pilots freak out now. It's like, no, 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 we got to go down. It's like, why? Even they don't know. Uh, but did you ever hear anything along those lines? Did anyone hear any whispers, rumors, myths, legends, rainbows, unicorns? I have not. Mm. Uh, I, I I haven't, um, but it's certainly feasible if they could get to that altitude. I mean, 747s are in the range of between forty and 50,000, but a lot of the private jets, um, Gulf Streams, and some of the Citations can get up to easily get above 50,000 feet service ceiling, so... Ooh. They can get up there. I, oh, that's, cool. that's all I know about it. But huh. I wonder. I, I should look into that. I'll see if I if I can pick up a hard copy of that because I, I it was something along the lines of that you're more likely to see things strange stuff hmm. that, up at that altitude. But who knows? I mean, in your case, I'm really surprised though, Jonathan, that you've never seen anything out in Iowa. I I know yeah. that Iowa is you know not exactly the most exciting state in the world, but it, no, but it's perfect for for the flat Earth concept because it is flat. <laughs> it, is, it is super flat. Um, is there and, military and, and, bases out there? I mean, no, we have nothing. There's some um, there's some MOAs out on the western side of the state, but there's nothing in the eastern side where we're at. But you know, uh, and just along those lines, speaking of Iowa and flat Earth, um, you know, just the other night we were up flying, and it was a super crystal clear night. A lot of times in the winter, you get really you know that dense air, but it's it's crystal clear. There's no humidity, um, and we can see. I can see lights out to. Basically, I think I calculated it was about seventy to eighty miles out, and I was like, I was about a thousand feet off the ground. You do the math, and it should it doesn't add up. So nice. Um, it just we see nice. it all the time out here. So. Oh well, I saw, uh, and I, I, I'll we'll get back to Dale in one second, but I got to mention this, and that was, and forgive me if I've repeated this before ever on air, but the uh, uh, did I show you the the did I talk about the Chicago skyline uh, time lapse? I love it. Go go. Well, time the um, the timeless. Well, you know, there was this guy, the guy that the the the, the famous shot of the Chicago skyline, kind of at sunset, and then one of the uh, the weather reporters on the local news said, "Well, this is a barrage. It's got to be mm-hmm. a barrage." Well, it turns out the same photographer. No one even talked about this, and somebody finally from the, from the flat Earth group put it up online, and I'm going to use it uh, in part of the slideshow for this video. Somebody he actually did a time lapse, like an 18 hour time lapse from the beach from that same location. 
and it's you know weather came by and and uh you know the you know the, you could see that you know the sun tracking and then you know it got dark and and the, you know everything lit up but basically the camera didn't move he had it perfectly locked in and the buildings were there the entire time so wow. yeah you want to show yeah. me a mirage from a uh from a single snapshot yeah fine you you want to call it a mirage fine i you know you you can have that i'll give you that one to you for free but an 18 hour mirage that doesn't waver <laughs> at all in weather you know clouds are going by and then it lights up at night and i think at the end you could even see the um you know the cleaning crews the like the janitor crews moving through the building from the top down where the lights w- would light up per floor and like move down moving moving down i was like well that's great so oh, yeah, yeah it, mirage my ass it's mirage it's yeah it's it's, it's ridiculous it's a- it doesn't add up. And and I want to kind of point out, too, John Laban, uh, he had some awesome videos. He did um, Ball Earth Math, I think is what he called them. Yeah. Um, it was a series. And he actually goes into, and I just want to point this out, because a lot of people with the curvature formula, you know, 8 inch per mile squared, that whole thing, yeah. that's accurate. But that's just for the drop from your plane shooting straight out um, across and then dropping down until you hit something. Yeah. He actually kind of goes into the end of uh, the obstruction of, you know, how much the Earth should the curve of the earth should be between you and another object, how much it should obstruct what you're looking at. And I just want to make sure people understand that there is a difference. And, but he does a great job of going through the math and explaining that either way, what we're all, what we're talking about here, it doesn't add up. You shouldn't be able to see it. So, Mm. yeah. Yeah, the the water's the easiest place to put it. I mean, I you know every time you do a land thing like the salt flats, any sort of salt flats, they're going to say, well, you know, yeah, that part of the ground is flat. You know, it's, it's they, they say, well, it's a flat part on top of a curved surface. And it's like you can't really argue with them because like, well, OK, no, it, it, it could, could be, be yeah. it could be a flat yeah. part on top of a curved surface. But the water, you can't do it because you can't curve water. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, you can people say, well, there's water tension. You look at a droplet of water, it's curved like a dome. I was going, yeah, but that's a tiny droplet of water that doesn't yep. that doesn't really count. Um, anyway, Dale. Well, real quick. Sorry, go ahead. What you're not talking about is that type of mirage. I forgot the scientific word there. Yeah, saying uh, the image is supposed to be in, inverted upside down. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It was like a major. So, minor... so why isn't it upside down? Yeah, yeah. The inverted. Yeah, people know. People have seen mirages. You don't see crystal clear mirages. You'll see. Yeah, we all know. We've grown up with television. Shows. No, I've seen mirages out in the desert. They're, they're upside down. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You might be able to see, and the the illusion of water. You know, the whole palm tree. You know, oh, away... I've seen it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we can, you can look in the highway and you know there's no water. The shimmering on the highway is not water. It's 100 degrees out. Mm-hmm. You know that's not water. And, but yeah, when you're looking at buildings, and you know what I've kind of been waiting for? And I get, I'm, every week I'm thinking of more and more things, which is, you know what we haven't seen from people? Because everyone says, well, okay, here's, here's Chicago. that you, you shouldn't be able to see it from this distance. Here's a, here's a lighthouse over here, and here's a building over here, you know, D- Detroit, T- Toronto. It, all over the world, people are doing this. You shouldn't be able to see this island or this mountain range. You know what nobody's really done and, and from the debunker standpoint? No one's come forward and says, hey, here's this lighthouse. It's 20 miles away. You shouldn't be able to see it. And you know what? You can't. <laughs> I'm zooming in with my with my what? No, they have. Somebody's actually zoomed in and said they can't fi- see it, and they and that's no actually... they, that they can see it, and they shouldn't. No, no, I'm saying where's where's the people yeah. that's saying that they can't see? Oh, it? you know yeah, what I mean? Position. They're coming. Yeah. They're coming out. The, where where's the debunker that says this lighthouse should not be visible from 20 miles or 30 miles? And they say I'm on the beach. I'm zooming in with my what a cool picks 900 or whatever the thing is now i'm zooming in and you know what i still can't see it therefore it proves that that, that there's a curve no, no one doesn't exist yeah nobody's done yeah. that nobody's done the opposite well, and you can't so people keep saying oh it's a mirage it's this it's that it's like nobody nobody's come back and said here is a movie or a still shot or anything of something i shouldn't see and i can't is it the The Covert Report with Susan Lindauer, Saturday and Sunday on Truth Frequency Radio.
Welcome back to Strange World. I'm your host, Mark Sargent, and that was Joe Jackson stepping out from his album Night and Day. Truth Frequency Radio, playing all your classic rock favorites. So, here we are, back with uh, Jonathan Walter from Walter Aviation and Dale, air traffic controller. Are you guys both there? Yep. Cool. Jonathan, are you there? Yep. <laughs> Jonathan is looking at naked people on his computer. I am sure of it. <laughs> so, uh, airplanes. Okay, okay. airplanes. Time. Got it. That's that's kind of like naked people to you, isn't it? it it's it's yeah for pilots. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. really. Weird. We're not going to go there anyway. We're looking at some, some some really sick military aircraft. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I got it. the ones with the um uh, like those like those shark mouths on the front with all the teeth. Like, oh, like, yeah. a, like a classic P-51 Mustang or something? Like, yeah, like the old uh, World War II yeah. uh, nose art, yeah. Yeah, right on. All right, so, uh, Dale, let's, let's get into a few other things, uh, shall we? Because you've got, you've got opinions, and uh, I'd like to hear them. And that well, is, what, uh, if, you, if you don't mind talking yeah, about... I'll, 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 I'll cover one opinion. Yeah. You know, I, I've been <laughs> all this conspiracy theory stuff, and after I became an Earth traffic controller um i changed my mos which just means you i change i kind of like whatever you come you change your job okay yeah and i went through a school again and got retrained and you know went to a different sector of the military um highly classified kind of stuff and one thing i will say when i listen to all these uh conspiracy theory websites a lot of them don't say anything okay so that's your first tip off yeah. when they don't say anything that's your first tip off to a disinformation agent. And there's a lot of them out there, I hate to say. Yeah. I haven't watched the news since uh, 1995 because I knew what's really going on in the world. And every time they're on the news, I'm like, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. <laughs> and I just stopped watching the news. I haven't watched the news since 1995. Wow. Um, I, I'll, I'll hear about these you know, false flag operations, which I have direct knowledge of. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll watch them. I'm like, yeah, you, know, you guys finally figured it out. I wish the rest of the public would figure it out. But anyway, um, one thing I want to comment on is I love how people say above top secret. Yeah. And I just want to clarify. I don't know if I, I'm probably crossing the line, but I'll, I'll say it. <laughs> um, there's, there's unconfidential. There's no such thing as above uncon- unconfidential. It's called, class, it's called um, confidential. Yeah. yeah. There's no such thing as above confidential. It's called secret. There's no such thing as above secret. It's called top secret. You know, um, you, you can have a, for example, when I was in a traffic controller, you know, I was, I had a secret security clearance and I had a fight line, um, security clearance. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like saying I had above secret fight line security <laughs> clearance. No, I had a secret security, security clearance with a flight line, you know, privilege, you know, and you hear people say, you know, I had a top secret security clearance level Q. Well, you just had top secret with access to level Q. Um, unfortunately, I, I actually actually know there is a level above top secret, and I'm not going to say the name, but it has a name. Okay. I've, I've never once in my entire life heard anybody on any conspiracy website use the correct terminology for what is above top secret. Really? Really, never. It's a code word. I've never heard the code word. All right. You know, and when I first learned about it, I laughed. Non-stop for five minutes. I near, I just about fell out of my chair. Literally fell out of my chair. Was, I sort could not. I couldn't believe the code word for what's above top secret. Was, sort of like when they were doing the uh, uh, the high altitude atomic testing back in the late fifties, and one of the packages was called Operation Fishbowl. Sort of, <laughs> 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 sort of like that. <laughs> yeah. Now you heard my laugh. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I when I heard that, they, I just they used the real word, but it's a code word, but it's. It tells you everything about the operation. It's hysterical. Nice. Hey, you know, it kind of, I hate to go into the Illuminati thing, but, you know, the, the, the theory is that they have to put out in public they, knowledge in order yep. for the work. Yeah. It, it goes into the witchcraft thing. In order yep. to cast a spell, you have to put it out there, and the people have to agree to it. If they, if they, don't, if, if, if they let it pass, then, boom, they, they're allowed to do it. And people mm-hmm. don't understand supernatural stuff. There, it, there's rules. And, yeah. and, there's rules. Yeah. Yeah, you have to you have to put it out there. It can't be completely hidden. Mm-mm. Yeah, because what's the point? Yeah. It, well, it, it not only it it, it 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 further enhances the spell. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, like anything. Yeah, the um, uh, hell, it because you get the public to hell. Yeah, to to give it energy, to to give it. Uh, I, I hate using the word manifest, but you know it does manifest it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like there's this guy who has these um, these little um, how boy, I'm going to go blank on this, but they basically measure the consciousness of the planet, uh, monitors all the internet and everything, and when the consciousness is focusing on something, then boom, something will happen. Like 9/11, right before it happened. Um, these, um, this, whatever keeps track of this stuff. Oh, right. I know what you're talking random, about. Random, random, uh, generators or. Yeah. Yeah. Random. yeah, yeah. There was a name Back. for it though. There was a, yeah. uh, there was a name for this. There's a, it's a program. Ah, uh, I'm drawing a blank too. Cause I haven't heard it in a couple of years. Man, it's a generator. He Jonathan said it. Yeah. yeah. There's another name for it. Yeah, I think there is. There's another, yeah. Web, there. like a web bot or something like that. Something like, yeah. Like web bot. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Anyway. And wow. then we also had, you know, um, there's been instances uh, where everybody got together and prayed and crime rate went down. I could see that. So there's proof that the consciousness of everybody affects the general um, reality. Oh, yeah. I have yeah. no doubt. I, I've yeah. seen it. I saw it back in uh, when I was in college ooh, a long time ago where uh, there was a professor that showed this sort of a limited stance. He goes, OK, I'm going to take two people, get them out of the room. Okay, first person, when they walk in, think nothing but happy thoughts. Because it was like one of those stadium classroom right. settings. So think nothing but happy, wonderful thoughts about this person. And he's going to walk all the way down to me. And then the second person, you're going to think nothing but horrible, hateful thoughts. You want to murder this person. And he's going to, you know, he or she is going to walk down. And then I'm going to ask him a question. How did you feel when you walked down? And, and it was exactly what they thought. It was like, wow, I felt really great walking down here. The other person's like, wow, it was, it was horrible. It's like something going on here. You know, I felt, you know, really, you know, like I was in trouble. And uh, it was, it was, it was, yeah. So, huh. it, you know, expand that to a bigger sense. And yeah, you bet we can create things. Yeah, like when someone walks in the room, they're really negative. Everybody can feel the vibration. Yeah, yeah. And and it expands on a global level, and that's how these folks operate. Yeah. Hey, uh, since you know, I I I don't want to uh, miss out on any questions uh, because Jonathan, did did you still have some more questions for Dale? Because we're in our last segment. Yeah, I want to keep going with this. though. this is good. You can keep running with that. Okay. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know how much further I was going to go with that, other than uh, what well, what, what he was saying. The yeah. oh you mean the code, you mean the code word that he's not going to say and and uh, the fact that that, he, had, that he's trying to ignore yeah yeah the <laughs> the that he had somebody that was read, trying to keep an eye on the world consciousness oh well that's that's where I was you know I do have something to add to this and that is because this is a question for for both of you but Dale specifically which is because you don't believe, because you know that anything in the mainstream media has an ulterior motive mm-hmm. do you think when and and I thought about this. I had a lot of people contact me about this, and that is once the flat Earth thing hit mainstream media, which it did in a big way. I mean, it hit all of them at the same time. You know, with the whole Neil deGrasse Tyson going on primetime television and addressing the flat Earth. You know, against a, a Grammy-nominated rapper. About they're talking about this. It's like okay, you know full well they're not only talking about this because they're allowed to be talking about this. So, right. Does it feel like a setup for something else? Like that this whole con- yeah, oh, yeah yeah the hundredth monkey scenario where it's like okay if enough people figure this you know start get this in their train of thought does that sort of change the reality and all of a sudden we get that that tipping point where we flip over and it's like okay uh, the world isn't necessarily a globe anymore it's something else. Do you think yeah. that's that's where we're going? Boy, I can't really comment on this, but it has to do with all the uh, explosion sounds we're hearing around the planet or. Whatever. That would make sense. Uh, and, and Jonathan, you sound like you're you're somewhat conspiracy based. You you know what the the loud booming and oh yeah yeah yeah. It sounds. Well, let me touch on that real quick. Um, yeah. I, I I knew a buddy of mine who worked at a Boeing aircraft, and uh, he is a the rivet and the bolt guy. And they had to stress test these bolts, and they would you know had a machine that would pull it apart till it broke, and when it broke, it sounded like a stick of dynamite going off. Yeah. Now people don't think of a bolt as a stick of dynamite going off. Well, we all know there's underground bases, okay, and there's yeah. tunnels and everything. Uh, that's public domain. Yeah. Well, you know, what if one of these – what if they have to come to the surface? They they don't want some Joe Smuck coming along and discovering one of the hatch holes and opening it up. Yeah. So these things are tightly bolted down, and when when they release them, the bolts are popped, and boom, you have an explosion. Yeah. And you think to, to that – well, yeah, but some of these sounds – 
uh, sound like they're – when I was listening to them, and I granted, you know, some are probably fake and some aren't. But that oh, sound, the sound – that's different. The sounds are different than the – Oh, you're pop- talking about the popping. The, I'm talking about the explosions specifically. Oh, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I could see that. I can but see. in regards to the sounds, and when I was in the Navy, we had to work in the, uh, the, the galley in boot camp, and we had this big rotisserie, and when it would go around because it was old, it, it literally sounded like whales – um, howling, and then occasionally it sounded exactly like the sounds that are heard around the earth. So yeah. it's, but bigger. But that, bigger. Yeah, but bigger. Yeah. That's when when I was listening. So, so let, let's say you're popping something from the earth and it's coming up and it's using mechanical stuff. And exactly. Then, exactly. You know where I'm going with that? I don't want to go in. No, no, I hear you. I already said too much. I know. It's all right. I, I hear you. No, I'll, I'll go down that road, which is the, the, I've always said since I've been looking at this thing that the world seems to be a giant machine. Uh, oh, yeah. It's a, it's a giant mechanical process. Oh, my gosh. Not, Real estate moves up and down, left and right, camouflage. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, police are in on it, the, the military. It's a huge military operation. When, when I hear the sounds, especially, when I, when I listen to I'm a big sound guy. I love listening to sounds. I'm big, I, I was a big sound effects guy for years uh, back in the software development days. And it, when I listen to this stuff, I was going, it sounds like things I've sort of heard before, but much, much bigger. It's like you're listening to like, a, like the inside of an industrial factory, but this industrial factory is like for giants or something. It's, it's really, really like, like, a, like a, it's like sometimes you, it's like listening to a set of doors open or shut and they're ancient and, and, uh, and rusty, but they're, but you're listening to them. It's going, it's something like that must be thousands and thousands of feet high or, you know, part of a mechanism that's... that's no, nah, it's just below the earth bouncing off. Well, there's that too. <laughs> anyway. I, no, I know. I know. So, what's... Uh, uh, what, uh, Jonathan, seriously, do you have... Because uh, we, we, we don't have much time left. Do you have, like, at 15, less than 12 minutes, what, what other little miscellaneous things did you have, or did you? Oh, well, I was going to ask a question. I don't know if, if, uh, if Dale can answer this or not, but when you were looking on your radar scope, um, I'm just curious as a pilot, how far out, and, I, and I'm going to use the ocean since I know you were near the ocean as a good flat plane to work with, how low could an aircraft go approximately, if you can tell me, bef- and, and how far out before you would lose them? What's kind of the ratio of, of height to distance before that radar would pick them up on the low end, not up high? Classified. Yeah. Okay. All right. That thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that um, but well, cool. you know, it, Mark, if I may plug my physics real quick. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. You got time. Okay. So we're hiding a lot more than the um, the flat Earth here. Um, basically, everything I'm going. I, I was, people don't know this. I, I have a physics background. Everything that you can see and experience in life can be explained by the four forces of the universe. There's a strong nuclear force, a weak nuclear force, electromagnetic, and gravity. Yep. And string theory, I, Albert Einstein can never unify these four forces. Mm-hmm. And when he died, the, you know, the protégés come along and go, well, he's, he's working with the limited four-dimensional universe. Let's, let's expand it out to the fifth at the sixth. At the sixth, we discovered this harmonic frequency. And then we went out to the tenth, tenth dimension. We found an origin point. And we're like, well, why, why stop there? And we went out, and at the 26th dimension, there was another origin point. I'm trying to be quick here. No, no you got time. Go and then we went out to infinity. So the decision with the string theory, which later become, became supersymmetry, is you know, the six dimensions of harmonic frequency. There's the 10th dimension and the, and the 26th dimension that have origin points. We, we're like, we don't know which. We had problems with like the tachyons and you know all these kind of problems. And I, I, I set my... Um, my research to the world's most renowned um, physicists, and I sent you my paper, Mark. You're welcome to post it on your website. People can read it. It's copyright okay. 1999 before M theory. So from my paper, I gave permission. I, I'm, I'm horrible at math. I gave permission for people to basically steal my work and develop the theory. And then, you know, after everybody got my paper, I'm sitting there reading the next book, and all of a sudden M theory, and I'm reading it, and it's like verbatim my paper. And I'm like, oh, my God, these idiots. They took my paper and they created this imaginary 11th dimension that exists outside the 10 dimensions. And they say the origin point exists outside the physical universe, which is my theory, dead okay. on. Okay. And, and they're saying this is the 11th dimension. Okay. Um, well, you can say there's a dome, you know, whatever, and this and that. But the point is, even when you go out to the grandiose scale of the universe, even physicists agree 
that there are boundaries and barriers and there's something that exists outside of the physical universe. So I don't care if you want to microscope it down to Earth or even if you take it to the physical universe. Even our scientists say that there is something outside of us. So there's a dome to the universe. There's a dome to the Earth. I don't care what you say. There's a dome. Yeah. yeah Rob, point. Rob Skiba, uh, and, and feel free to interrupt me anytime. We, we've still got nine minutes, ten, almost ten minutes. And that is uh, Rob Skiba was kind of talking about that in some of his videos where he was saying, he's going, look, from everything I've read, and granted he was using biblical stuff, was saying that, look, it appears like that we're a dome inside a big box. Right. And that, like you were saying, uh, even mainstream science will say, look, there's limits to this. And, and that, but he was, but Rob Skiba was saying, well, look, there's an edge. It's like because it, that, there that, is. That, that we're inside some sort of container, uh, which, which again makes sense to me because why, why wouldn't there be? You know, the infinite mm-hmm. doesn't make, doesn't, nobody can ever process the infinite. And I know, I know it's easy for us. It's like, well, you're just create, you're try, just trying to deal with it. You're trying to resolve the infinite by creating a box. It's like, well, why, why wouldn't we? It's, uh, but, but yeah. So I'm sorry. Just for the people who don't know, uh, can you can you uh, expand a little more on the origin point? The, yeah. Uh, so it, it basically, you know, people know about the dub, the double slit experiment, yada yada. Yeah. Uh, particles sometimes act as a wave. Some, and I'm trying to be brief here. Sometimes yeah. act as a wave. Sometimes they there's an observer and act. The, the, the tree it, falling in the forest. So, so basically, yeah. um, we we have two fields of physics. There's, there's general relativity, everything large. Quantum physics, everything that's small. If you take the equations, like let's say one plus one equals two in, gen- in quantum physics, everything's cool. But you take the same one plus one equals two in general relativity and equals two, six, eight, negative ten. It, it, all the equations completely fall apart. And all the equations in general relativity, you apply them to quantum physics, they completely fall apart. And, and, and everyone is scratching their heads going, what the hell is going on? And they haven't been able to figure out how to unify them. What the answer is, there is a field of general relativity. There is a field of quantum physics. And I discovered the third field of physics, which I just will call the invisible. Mm -hmm. Ironically, my paper is called Harmony. And M sits right over the M theory, uh, right over the center symbol of the invisible universe. And, you know, I sent my paper to all the renowned physicists and theoretical mathematicians in the world. And I just find it a coincidence that's called M theory, which sits right above my theory. It's like directly out of my paper. It's, it's ironic. And, um, um, once you identify this third field of physics, it unifies the six, uh, the six dimension harmonic frequency. It unifies everything and it goes, um, according to the, the revelation, it's all Bible verse. Okay. I take the book of revelation. I quote the Bible. I quote, uh, physics, you know, left, right. Here's physics. Here's the Bible. Here's physics. Here's the Bible. I I nicknamed my paper paper physics of the Bible. Yeah. Um, I'll make it available for free. Who anybody who wants to read it? Cool. Wow, that's great. So so the paper you sent to me because uh, I you, people aren't going to email you directly at least not yet. Um, if anyone's listening uh, and you want a copy, and I'm sorry, the 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 title of the paper is called because I I had no. Well, I I originally called it the Throne of God because that's the Book of Revelation when he's taken up to the Throne of God. That's what the physics paper is called, the Throne of God. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Interesting. That's a bold. Yeah. And oh, did did you mention? I don't think we. I I I graduated from Vanguard University, magna cum laude. Wow. I was lay minister for ten years. I'm I'm well versed in the Bible. Right on. Right, so you've been following a little bit of uh, maybe Rob Skiba, maybe maybe Tiger Dan, those guys, some of the people that are kind of doing the flatter stuff, a little bit. Yeah, and my paper was copywritten in 1999. It's in the Library of Congress. It's public knowledge, and this is before M3 ever came out. Nice, nice. Okay, wow. so what you sent to me that I'm going to be sending to people if they email me at msergeant23 at comcast.net. Uh, and, and if you forgot to write that down, it's at the end of all, uh, every video I ever have is my email address. I'm going to be sending them M theory or is it, or is it, is that what it's called? What, what I'm sending them? Well, the title's called the throne of God. Title is called the throne of God, but the, but it actually goes into M theory. Hey, well, this is before M theory came out. Oh, wow. All like right. I said, M theory came from my paper. This is pretty deep stuff, man. It's huge. Wow. I, I basically prove, uh, I, I, I. Unify the four forces. Oof. All right. Huh. 
That's that's great. I'm you from, know from a biblical perspective. From a biblical perspective, all wow. Bible first. Yeah, you you need to talk to Rob. Skiba. Yeah, you need to talk to Rob Skiba about this uh, or or controversy. Yeah, and the or... thing is, you know, I unfortunately sent my my work out to mainstream, but if if I can get a hold of a theoretical mathematician or a uh, theoretical you know physicist, um, it, little, it's, little... it's so easy to prove the theory of everything. Of everything and it's ridiculous. Uh, th- the, unfortunately, theoretical physicists are, are tough to find. They're they're, they're th- oh, they're very hard to find. Yeah, thin on the ground, and uh, as of late, they've been kind of running from us or anyone that's even related to us. <laughs> uh, I can't I can't get most university professors that have already been exchanging emails with each other, and and it's like do not talk to these people. It's like all right, that's fine. You can avoid us. You can run, but you can't hide. The um. Well, you, 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 if you look at the geometric structure, um, my paper has the ge- geometric structure. The structure. Sorry, I'm getting it's, it's late okay. here. Of the universe, and um, it's basically a computer. Like when they came out with dark matter and dark energy, I went to my paper and I did yeah. the calculations. I'm like, well, there it is. They either my paper is accurate or they they're pulling it off my paper. Right on. And then when they come out with a new discovery, I go right back to the page. It's like a computer, seriously. Cool. And I just. I look at the the structure and I go. I do the equations. I do the calculations. They're going boom. There it is. Yeah. It's like every every scientific discovery goes right back to my paper. You really need to uh, uh, um, be on either Rob Skiba's show or Celebrate Truth or Controversy Seven. Unfortunately, Tiger Dan not going to be able to help you because he's off doing his own thing. But uh, but yeah, that'd be really great. Yeah, uh, email that email me the names later. I, I'm going to. Well, I'll get. What I'll do is because uh, he's actually on on Skype as well. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you the the contact info as soon as we're done here, and then you can. Uh, but they're they're hiding the third field of physics. Is what they're doing. Wow. Because it explains everything. Wow. And you that know, that, it, that makes sense because everyone thinks well they're only hiding they've only been hiding physical things, and the the truth is well no they'd hide anything that would be disruptive of this and that includes entire concepts. Well, because it, well, anything um, you, you it, like electricity takes a certain amount of energy to input for the energy output, and yeah. if you discover something that creates a greater output than electricity than what goes into it, yeah. it's immediately classified secret or yeah. whatever. Yeah, or, so or they're, they're or, hiding energy. Oh yeah, that and I mean everybody knows that because we thought of this back in the sixties. Like we should have flying cars by now. We should have, you know, the everything that we've we've thought we've had. The future that everyone envisioned 50, 60 years ago, that hasn't happened. Well, anti gravity has been discovered on an unclassified level. Well, yeah, yeah. But can you do it with a power can you use it to uh control craft? That's the big thing. You know, cheap, well, I've, I've seen it, yes. Yeah. Well, cheaply, you know what I mean? Where no, uh, I've seen it, you, you can. Well, I believe you. I, I absolutely believe you. I I have no doubt that the uh the, the unified field was engine uh has been out well you know i don't i don't want to get into the whole bob lazar thing and all no that. but you're right on yeah yeah but, yeah bob lazar exactly i but they can't but in in the the model that i came up with it was well, i'm sorry not that i came up with i'm sorry the model that i enhanced was the uh that you couldn't allow something like that a technology like that out because it changes too many things and it allows people to kind of figure out where we are uh huh. And at that point, it's. I mean, they've been suppressing it so long, and and we've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, but yeah, it, it destroys the oil industry, the electricity industry. Yeah. It destroys everything. Yeah, yeah. Tesla. Who knows? Tesla probably had the. Change. Oh, wait, oh. Uh, com, uh, Albert Einstein had a. <laughs> they say a IQ of 164. I'm sorry, that's not a genius. A genius IQ is 200. Everybody knows that. Yeah. There's that show. It's like. I forgot the name of the show. There were a bunch of geniuses that go around and solve stuff. Oh, yeah, that crap. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Main Media is saying Albert Einstein had a high IQ of 164 and a genius. Just Google it. The Genius Club starts at 200. I have a measurable IQ of 197. Holy smokes. That's way up there, man. Yeah, I can prove it. My, my day-to-day operational IQ is 174. I have actually two measurable IQs. Wow. I'm gonna I, as soon as I'm done with this, I'm gonna grab your paper because I you you were sending me so much stuff I could didn't even have a chance to read it all. Well, I hope you understand it because there's only 500 people in existence that can even comprehend it. Right on, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. Any any parting shots before uh, we are out of here for the night? Any uh, any? Um, yeah, my last comment. I awesome discussion. I'm glad we got to talk to Dale and all that. I hope. Uh, whether it's flat or round or whatever it turns out to be, I think it's a great way for people to open up and seek the truth and use their common sense because truth is simple. Just use your eyes and 
see what's around you. Excellent. Really cool. Uh, Dale, any, uh, any, any parting shots, any, anything that you recommend that people look at, uh, other than, you know, the paper that I, I will email out to people that ask at msergeant23 at comcast.net. Well, the, the paper is a little bit of a segue, um, off the, you know, that topic, but okay. You know, I, I, I'm here as a sub- subject matter expert, you know, pretty much discussion closed. I can see aircraft 350 miles away that are supposed to be at 81,000 feet. Impossible. Wow. Got it. Right on. I mean, hard fact, case closed. Cool. Cool. Well, I'd like to thank Dale very much for coming on the show and sharing. Also, I'd like to thank Jonathan from Walter Aviation. If you're in Iowa and not doing much, because apparently there's not much to do in Iowa, hey, go out and, and have an aer- aerobatic uh, flight with Jonathan. You'll love it. That'd be, love it. <laughs> that'd be fun. <laughs> and don't, don't eat a big breakfast before you do it. Please don't. No, no, that would be bad. And uh, next week, we're probably going to do my mailbag, I think, because I, I, this show is now put me way behind in the mailbag. So uh, until next time, you guys stay flat. Number nine.